I cannot believe this church. I really can't. It's um, so spirit-filled, you would not believe it. Every one of those songs that um, Ben chose today is all about the message today. Every single one of them. Yeah, and I... (laughs) This one is an amazing song. And the question is, and I asked the boys to put it up again um, as I started, because, uh, and I'll have to repent for this afterwards, but sort of 30 odd years ago when I was a new Christian, and I told you that I used to get up early in the morning at 4.30, 5 o'clock and watch certain people on um, early morning television. And one of them, I'll call her Joyce. I didn't know much back then, right? But but I can remember she was at a conference, a women's conference, and they and they sang this song, and she got them to put the this the chorus up, and she said, "Do you all obey that? Do you all surrender all to God? And not one of you do. I don't." There are things that we hold on to, things that we that think that he either doesn't want to know about. He's omniscient, please, he's omniscient. But there are things that we kind of reserve to ourselves. And it was, um, and Joyce, Joyce actually said uh, to the ladies, and there was a couple of thousand of them, she said, you don't, you know. There are things that we hold back from God. Uh, and, and it's part of our humanity, it's part of our old old us that um, constantly wars with the new us and I just asked the boys to put that up that's that's really where this thing comes from today it's and you know what last I think it was winter last year wasn't it Um, a young man called Ben Stout walked into our one of our Wednesday night um, Bible studies and uh, he was carrying a guitar (laughs) and we thought no we're a conservative evangelical Bible (laughs) believing and so anyway he said can I sing a song and we uh, we all said yeah 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 and this is his ministry's just developed out of that do you see what I mean and what a blessing it was today it was an absolute blessing to have um and 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 people are rising up in this church um and and coming to Sue and I and offering to do things without even being asked, you know, we were at a church in the northern suburbs once and every Sunday when you were coming into church you got a card rammed into your hand so, and then the youth pastor would come up and say, don't forget to fill in the card where you would like to serve in ministry in this church. And it was like you were obligated or compelled to do it. And, uh, you know, when Sue and I took over this church um, nearly three years ago, two and a half years ago, we gave it to Jesus. Seriously, when we went home after we were ordained, uh, we just looked at each other and we said, well, this is going to be Jesus' church. It's either going to work or it's not. And uh, we're here still two and a half years later. And, And Jesus is the head of this church. Please believe me, he is the head of this church. And... um, This is a sort of parenthetical insert message today because, you know, we had a look at Daniel 7. Daniel 7 is a very amazing um, passage of scripture because it details um, world history from 600 BC right up to the uh, end of the uh, tribulation period. And um, it's a very difficult passage. I got lots of debates with people over the, the name Ancient Today's and I love it. I still, I love that. I love people texting me and emailing me and saying, well, I believe this and I believe that. And I said, well, that's right. Let's have a conversation about it. Um, I usually end up being, being right, um, uh, even if I'm wrong, because I'm the pastor. Um, but it, it, it's, it's, it's amazing. But we, in our midweek Bible study um, over the last months we've been doing 1 Corinthians and we finished 1 Corinthians 14 
last week, we had the Zoom the previous week, oh no, the, the home the previous week and the Zoom this week. And the whole message in 1 Corinthians 14 is order in the church, where God, Jesus, has to be in charge of the church, not personalities, not ministries, not egos, nothing like that. God has to be in this church. And, and in verse um, 33, which is um, halfway through this passage, Paul says a very interesting thing. And you know, sometimes you can read a verse time and time and time again over the years, and you go, okay, I know I've read it, and you move on to the next one, but this really hit me this week. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. And verse 40 is, let all things be done decently and in order. God is a God of order and peace and righteousness and all the rest of it. And, and you know, um, we're so blessed to be together in this fellowship. Uh, and, and Sue and I have just been watching and, you know, we listen to various commentators online who are documenting the incredibly rapid collapse of society, especially Western society around the world. And um, when Daryl started the Habakkuk uh, series earlier in the year, the theme was God is in control. Well, he is. He always has been and he always will be. But sometimes as Christians, we feel like, well, where are you? Why aren't you putting a stop to this? Why aren't you, um, you know, truncating this? And the reality is, he is going about his business bringing to an ultimate end the new heavens and the new earth, which every one of you here are going to be citizens of. And we're going to go through, or the world is going to go through, a very painful passage over the next few years, and we won't be here. But it looks like we're being introduced to the birth pang part of the sequence. And uh, Jesus said to the disciples, Matthew 24, in this life you will have tribulation, low, low, um, lowercase t. Not tribulation, the tribulation, but you will have trib tribulation in this, in this life. And Christians seem now to be coming the target for the left. Hitler had the Jewish people. It seems like the, the, the left in, in 2021 has decided to target evangelical Christianity. And Sue has got these um, news feeds on her phone, um, usually from the US. And I wanted to um, identify some of the things that have come through over the last couple of months. And, and these may shock you. It'll shock me if they don't shock you, because they certainly shocked Sue and I. Uh, and it's the descent into insanity. It really is. Um, we both say that Sue's dad was the elder in a Methodist church and, and a, a very high-ranking um, teacher in a, a private school. Uh, and my parents were the product of the Great Depression, World War II, and etc. And we said to each other, imagine trying to sit them down now and explain to them what's happening in this world. They would be, it would be beyond their comprehension that the society they grew up in has become this society. And in fact, Dad and many other um, people went to war and served in World War II to defend freedoms that are being trashed before our very eyes. And it, it's just staggering. But these are, are three little incidents that have come through on you, Sue's news feeds, and they just stagger me. The first one, and this is about two months ago, you know how people can choose now to identify with someone or something? You can either change, you can change your gender from day to day to day. Um, you can identify as things you are obviously not. And this woman decided that she wanted to identify as a disabled person. And so what she did is she poured 
a bottle of strong acid into both of her eyes and blinded herself. A man in his late 60s advertised on Craigslist, which I believe is America's version of our gum tree, right? He advertised for a nanny because he now identifies as a nine-month-old baby. <laughs> you feel like shutting the doors and never going back out there again. And the sickest one, Sue said to me yesterday, uh, you know, I, I make the coffee and the crumpets and bagels and that sort of thing, and we just sort of wake up to the day and we have a look at what's going on, and this has to be the worst. A couple of days ago, I think it's in New York State, a man applied to the local court for a license to marry his own child. And I simply cannot believe it. But what is even worse is where is the outrage? Where is the commentary confronting this kind of descent into insanity? Where is it? And where is the church speaking out? And uh, I hope, you know, we're, we're online and, and, and someone sent me a text this morning that you're... Um, we go to England for Jill and Sonia and the rest of it, and Sweden, and uh, I just got a text from Henny this morning that several people in South Africa and, and other places and uh, Appalachia in the United States are listening, and I hope that this inspires people, at least in their local communities, to speak up, because they win if we remain silent. Do you know what I mean? It takes courage to speak out, but they win, the leftists, the godless win, if we don't say something. And uh, the problem that we have at the moment is big tech uh, is silencing all opposition to these things. And, uh, and, and, and I, I actually give credit to people who are trying to open up other avenues where rational people can meet with rational people and have rational conversations. Um, and it's just amazing. And, and the message today is, is, in fact, order in the church. And a commentator said this once, a church meeting should reflect the character of God and be controlled by the Holy Spirit in a corporate sense and display the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And I, I, this is not me big noting myself. This is me making an observ observation about this church. And I don't think in my 30 years of being a Christian I've ever seen another church that, that display some of those um, attributes. And it's to your reward and blessedness in heaven that, that uh, because you as the congregation create the sense of fellowship. Uh, and, and Sue and I are just absolutely and utterly amazed at, at what's happening. But, you know, when God is a God of peace and order, everything that he ever initiated, everything that he, he ever put into motion was always perfect, it was all, always decent, it was always orderly, it was always righteous, it was always godlike. And um, I'm just going to go through a couple of passages. I know you've heard them, but I, I want you to see them in a different way this time. And I want you to go to Ezekiel 28 in your Bibles, please. And we'll just read a couple of verses there. You should all know by now, it's one of my favorite passages. It's about the fall of Lucifer. And don't forget that when God created the angelic realm, every single one of them were holy angels. 
And when he created Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, they were, as far as godly as can, we can be, they were godly, righteous human beings. But God gave every being, both angelic beings and you and I, a gift that is so dangerous. Do you know what it is? Sovereign will. Sovereign will. Amen. We can choose whether to obey or rebel. We can choose. And what staggers me is that the vast majority and a seemingly increasing majority these days are choosing to rebel. But let's just have a look at a few verses where God had set up the angelic realm and he, he set up an individual who was the perfection of beauty. So in Ezekiel 28, he says here, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation against the king of Tyre and say to him, and thus says the Lord God. It is not about the king of Tyre. The king of Tyre was never in Eden, the garden of God. This is one of these double um, um, look through uh, pro prophecies and statements by God because at the start of this particular chapter, He's talking about the Prince of Tyre, and that's the human king, the human ruler. Now he's going to the power behind the throne. And do you know there has been a spiritual power behind every empire that's ever existed in this world? And unfortunately, the vast majority of them have been evil spirits. And he says, you were the seal of perfection. This is what God is saying about Lucifer, the light bearer at the time. Full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God, and every precious stone was your covering. And I won't go through them all. That's the stones that are on the breastplate of the high, high priest. And it, so it, uh, some commentators make the point that maybe he was head of worship and, and, and religious or whatever, formal um, worship before God in heaven. And the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day that you were created. Look at everything that God gave him. Perfection, beauty, precious, everything that was, that was um, admired and, and, and wonderful was given to him by God. And you were the anointed cherub, verse 14, who covers. That means he was in charge. And I established you. I, God, established you. Now, God the Father designed all of this, but Jesus was the one that spoke everything into being. And you were on the holy mountain of God. And you walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways, from the day that you were created till iniquity was found in you. And, John, you give me the wrong setback, but it doesn't matter because I can remember them. We should have Ephesians uh, 1 verses 3 because what he has done for you, uh, for, sorry, for Lucifer, God has done for you and I. And what does it say in Ephesians 1.3? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. What's been left out? Nothing. You have been given as a born-again believer in Jesus Christ everything you need to please God. Everything you need. And that's why I got the guys to put that chorus up before. Because in order to be in that right relationship with God, there shouldn't be anything that you are unwilling to surrender to him. There shouldn't be any. But there is in every one of us. And here's the iniquity that was found in Lucifer. In Isaiah 14, verses 12 to 15. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground. You who weakened the nations, for you have said in your heart, who will? 
I will. How many times have we said that to God in our private conversations with him? I did when I was so fit and healthy and, you know, doing mining stuff and all the rest of it. Um, I was full of I wills. That's all right, God, I will take care of this. I will do this because I was young, strong and stupid. (laughs) And it takes a loving God to just teach you a few life lessons, to teach you that, no, you not only can't do everything, you can't do anything without him. And, you know, he had to throw me stage four cancer and three heart attacks. And my sister, older sister, said, well, if he's a God of love, why does he do that to you? And I said, because he wanted to draw me closer. He wanted to draw me closer. He wanted to take the me out of me and replace it with him. And I tell you what, that's one of the toughest struggles that we as believers have. Because Lucifer said this, because he had sovereign free will. One day he decided, I don't want to be the manager anymore, I want to be the boss. And he said, I will ascend into heaven and I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. That's the Shekinah glory of God. I will be like the most high. And God says in verse 15, yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. Whatever we decide, whatever anyone else decides, be aware that God is in total control. And when we see the world in the state that it's in, I cannot believe it. And I threw just a little verse in here. Uh, Some of the commentators said, well, I don't believe that you know, Lucifer actually had a throne in heaven. Well, he may not have had it in heaven. I have a thesis that I'll maybe tell you about one other day. But I do believe he had a throne because it quite simply states in verse 13, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. And look what it says in Revelation 13 verse 2. Now the beast, this is the the, um, Antichrist, the first beast, which I saw was like a leopard and his feet were like the feet of a bear and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. Remember, this is looking back to the the time of Daniel in Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 2, but Daniel chapter 7 specifically because he's looking backwards and why the order of the animals is reversed. In Daniel chapter 7, it was a lion, a bear, and a leopard. Here, it's a leopard, a bear, and a lion. Why? One's looking forward, one's looking back. But this is the very interesting thing. The dragon, that is Satan, gave him his power, comma, his throne, and great authority. So if he didn't have a throne, why would he say, I've given my throne to the beast? And I only say those things because I know already who's going to be emailing me, texting me during the week, and that'll start another discussion. But, do you say, but please believe me, I don't do these things just to sensationalise things. These things are the scriptures. These things are in the book. These th- are things that we are called upon to understand and to, to comprehend And they're all there. All you need to do is just stitch them together. God has put all of his doctrines and teachings right through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And they're all there. They're all spread through there in a little place here and a little place there and a little place there. Why doesn't he just have everything in order in chapters? Because Satan could come along and rip that chapter out and you wouldn't have a clue about salvation, about sin, about redemption, about the cross. You wouldn't have these things, but it's spread all the way through. Who would have believed that 
40 years before Jesus came the first time that Isaiah would write 52 uh, last three verses and all of 53 that would describe everything that we needed to know about Jesus Christ, the coming Messiah. And in Psalm 22, David wrote it a thousand years before Jesus and everything that took place on the cross is in Psalm 22 down to the smallest detail. A thousand years before it happened. God is in control. And through prophecy, he lets us know that he's in control because these things come to pass right when they are supposed to. You know what? The last thing Satan wanted Jesus to do was to die on the cross. He tried every trick in the book, I, either not to have him born or to be killed as a baby through Herod or to be uh, tempted by Satan in Luke 4 and Matthew 4 and uh, to so annoy and enrage the Pharisees that twice or three times they picked up stones to stone him for blasphemy. And Jesus would just walk through. Luke chapter 4, he annoyed the people in the, in the synagogue at Nazareth so much that they actually grabbed him physically and took him outside of the synagogue and they were going to throw him off a high cliff. And he just disappeared. He died on a cross because it was established in his word and it's that way and only that way that is the reason all of you are here today. And I am here today. And no one will thwart the will of God. Not for Jesus, and by the way, not for you. Do you get that? He loves you with such an intensity. He has a will and a plan for your life. And if you're like me, you will have been silly enough to fight it sometimes. But when you grow and mature and get old and weak... You go, I surrender all. Because you got nothing left. And look what Jesus did for us as human beings in Genesis 1, 26 to 31. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Can you believe it? Um... We are made in the image of God and in the likeness of God. Every single human being is eternal. Do you know why? Because we have a soul that will never die and the soul will, will uh, embody a body that will either be in heaven or the other place. So in that eternal eternality, that is our soul. And that's why this fallen down, broken thing here that we were given at birth has to be replaced by one that's eternal. And we get that. We get that. Daryl said to me the other day, hopefully in the rapture, but we do get it when we are resurrected. We get our resurrection bodies. We need them to be in the presence of God and we will be eternally with him. Can you believe it? It's amazing. And you know what? When this whole message came to me and hit me, God is a God of order and not confusion. He's, Paul is talking to a Corinthian church, and the church was shambolic, right from chapter 1 to chapter 15 and all the way through 2 Corinthians to chapter 13. It was a shambolic church. They couldn't do more wrong if they tried but they were still brothers and sisters in Christ. And do you know the really astonishing thing? That when the dust settles up there, you'll be able to talk to them because they're brothers and sisters in Christ and they will be up there with us. And you can say, well, we belong to Calvary Chapel, Perth. You guys didn't do much. <laughs> oh, that's right, there's no pride, my wife. You need a wife every now and again, do you know what I mean? When God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. He was giving us dominion. You and I, our grandfather and grandmother got dominion over this entire planet. 
And it said, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them. Thank you. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, see... I have given you. What did he say to Lucifer? I have provided you. I gave you. You were the seal of perfection. You were number one in the angelic realm. What's he saying to Adam? I have given you. Every herb, I'll rush through, every tree, every seed, also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, to everything that creeps on the earth, in which there is life. I have given every green herb for food. And it was so. And God then saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. And so the evening and morning were the sixth day. Everything was good. Everything was provided for us. All we had to do was to receive it and obey but one day, one day, the Nakash, the shining one, came to the garden. In Genesis 3, 1 to 7. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, which is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God has said, you shall not eat it. Now what did she say next? Nor shall you touch it. God never said that. Never said that. And you know, when that commandment came to Adam in chapter 2, verses 16 and 17... Eve hadn't been created yet. Do you get it? He only gave it to Adam. It was Adam's responsibility to tell Eve. And look what Eve has got. So did Adam make a mistake? Yeah. Or did Eve make a mistake? The wives will say Adam made the mistake. <laughs> and the husbands will be wise enough not to comment on that at all. But... <laughs> It was a distortion of scripture. It was a distortion of scripture. And look what she said. And you, uh, Sorry. And, the serp uh, uh, and God said, you shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be what? What did he want to be in heaven? Like God. Same message that he fell for from the source of his own heart. He's now given it to Adam and Eve, Adama and Hava. And he said, you will not die and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and, the, and a tree desirable to make one wise... She gazed at it. Do you know what I mean? She gazed at it. And a commentator, I think it was Chuck Missler, um, how many here have listened to him off and on over the years? He's brilliant. He was brilliant. Not without fault, but he was brilliant. And he said, isn't it interesting how everything that mucks us up in our life, we see with our eyes. Jesus called it the lust of the eyes, which becomes the lust of the flesh. But faith comes by what? It's, he just made that comment. He, makes, he, he always used to throw in these little, tiny little gold flakes that you'd pick up and I'd always listen to them. And so the woman saw that the tree was good. And in verse 7, sorry, she uh, also gave the husband with her to eat. They both ate of the fruit. 
Um, there's a real problem in the translation of the Hebrew. It says her husband with her. Um, there is debate about whether or not he was away somewhere. That's how the serpent got to Eve and tricked her. But when she offered him the, uh, the fruit he ate, then the eyes of both of them were open and they knew that they were naked, not like God. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. You know, the, the, the huge issue here is that we, is we face the same danger, that we can sovereignly choose to obey him or we can sovereignly choose to rebel against him. And, uh, you know, it's, it's strange. I, I listened to a commentator this week uh, and he was talking about cleaning up, being a, being a child in, in your parents' house and being sent to your bedroom because they're so sick and tired of the state of your bedroom that they say, go into your bedroom and clean it up. And so what do you do? You go into the bedroom and you start looking under the bed and under pillows and in drawers and you think, I haven't seen that for six months. And you sit down on the carpet and you go, broom, broom, you're not cleaning anything up. You're just playing with things that come from back from the past. And mum and dad walk in and they go, what are you doing? And, they, and you go, nothing. You're not cleaning your room up. You know, it's like... Um, uh, being under, under instruction. I mean, my poor parents, my poor, poor parents, my poor wife. <laughs> when I was a teenager and I was working, um, mum just gave up on my room because to get into it, you had to get to the door and, yeah, and <laughs> everything backed up against... The, and, and I used to work night shift and Sue was at teacher's college during the day. She'd, she'd come at home at three o'clock in the afternoon and I had to take off at five. And she'd say, hi, Mum, to, to my mum. She says, Stuart, there... And she said, well, go and see if he's awake because I've got his dinner, this afternoon dinner, and just see if you can get in there and see if you can wake him up. So she... She's, uh, uh, and she'd sort of stick here. I never cleaned my room up. I don't know. She did. She, she got so sick and tired of it, she did. But this lady here is shaking her head. Let me tell you, after 46 years of marriage, I'm very good at cleaning my room up now. <laughs> I am excellent. I can do my own ironing. I do everything. But, you know, it's this sovereign will. You know, we get told by our parents to clean up our room and we go in and we play with our toys. God will speak to us through the word of God when you're reading it devotionally. He'll speak to you through a message. He'll speak to you through a conversation with a Christian friend and you get reminded, ah, I've got this thing. Yeah, I need to deal with it. And what do you do? Well, you just tuck it away again. And you put it away, I'll, I'll get to that soon. I'll fix that soon. And what happens? It just gets put back on the shelf, under the bed, in the drawer, and you say, I'll get back to that later. It's just the, the outworking of our human will that seems to be, since Adam fell, we are in direct contravention for God's best will for our lives. And we want the best for our lives. God wants to give us the best of our lives. But we need to start listening to his voice and we need to start working out why it is that sometimes we just hold things back from him. Um, it's, it's really quite profound why we do this. And it's because... Uh, when, when I was unsaved, um, I was just a normal, ordinary bloke. Um, but it was, it, it was very, very interesting. I mean, I had been blown away by you guys on the chat site because for months and months and months, I had been saying to myself, I'd like more hymns in the praise and worship, at least one a week. And the Holy Spirit said to me, don't push it. Don't force it. Listen to me. Let it go. 
So what's happened? Ben just said, oh, we might like some hymns in the, in the um, um, praise and worship every now and again. And there's about that long of messages on the chat site with all of you guys giving your favorite hymns and wanting to hear them. And you see, if you wait for the voice of the Holy Spirit, if you wait for his direction, if you follow his lead, it comes to pass at the right time. I could have said it six months ago, I'd like more hymns in the praise and worship, and it would have fallen like a rock. It wouldn't have been anointed. It would, you know, I love them, but the way that we just sang there today, I could stand at the front and the force of your singing was just blowing me forward. It was amazing. You guys love it as well. And this is the problem that, that we are dealing with in this world at the moment. And Sue just said to me this morning, Another one thing came through um, that now the uh, certain governments, state governments in America and the left intellectuals are now saying that the cause of the COVID-19 virus were white, conservative, evangelical Christians and they have decided to not take the vaccine and keep the pandemic going. Seriously? But that's the state of their mind. And where is the outrage, where is the commentary defeating this? And I just look at these people and I say, how can you possibly descend to such intellectual depths to A, think it and then say it and then try and enforce it? So the next few months, I'm telling you right now, are going to be very interesting for Christians. I do believe that in WA we have some, some blessing still remaining from God. But you just wait. Mark McGowan may not be a baddie, but 46 of his people of his caucus, 46 are leftists, and 26 are mainstream, middle-of-the-road people. So you've got a left-wing caucus that is going to tell him what to do. So we need to be praying and interceding. But these people are driven by this kind of understanding. Romans 1, 20, 32. This will get us put off Facebook. Bye. <laughs> and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, immorality, wickedness, covetous, maliciousness, full of envy, Murder, strife, deceit, evil-minded, they're whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, and disobedient to parents. Did ever, all of you follow the news reports watching America descend into chaos last year? On the streets of the cities? It's, a, it's described here. Paul describes what's happening to these people 2,000 years ago. It's human nature. It's not the 21st century. They just have the technology to do it at this time. And we have, they are um, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. And do you know what? In, Je in um, Romans 1, 24, 26, and 28, God describes the handing over, and it's directed by him. God gave Lucifer everything he needed to be number one. God gave Adam and Eve everything they needed to have dominion over the earth. But what has he done with a God-rejecting generation? He has said, I will give them over to immorality, verse 24. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, Sue and I as kids watched that blossom in the 60s. Can anyone remember the 60s? 
you weren't there. All right? The 60s, we started seeing it. It was turning. It was the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, all the rest of it. There was the drug culture. There was the uh, anti-Vietnam Vietnam War protests. There was civil unrest. We just saw it starting up. And in the 80s, what happened? We had this problem with um, the converse sexuality issue. And in verse 28, he said, when all of these things have come to pass, and God says in every verse, I gave them over. Do you understand? God gave them over to that depravity because they had totally and utterly rejected him. When does... Human, when do human beings get to that stage where God says, enough is enough? Well, I'll tell you, we had a flood in Genesis 7, 8, and 9. Do you remember that? That was when God said, enough is enough. We had Sodom and Gomorrah. What did he do? God said, enough is enough. And there are smaller Incidences right throughout the Old Testament where God said to certain tribes and countries and even Israel, enough is enough. And God has given this generation over in, the, in verse 28 to a reprobate mind. Do you know what a reprobate mind is? A reprobate mind is this. You reject all judgment. You basically say, I can do what I like, no one is going to judge me. Well, look at society. Standards, norms, disciplines, relationships, completely and utterly calamitous. Completely and utterly calamitous. Why? Because God has given them over to a reprobate mind. Um, John MacArthur calls that process giving them over to insanity. And it's true. But it just means this. As Christians, the pressure comes off to be even more of a witness than we were 20 or 30 years ago when we were not under threat we have now an opportunity. There are so many people out in that, that society who haven't bought totally in to the depravity that we see. So they are the people that God expects you and I to talk to. And you know, it's amazing. It's amazing. During the meet and greet, just today, someone here in this congregation has come up to me and said, Stuart, I'm a trained person in communication skills to teach people how to talk to one another and to reach other and to actually use that opportunity to spread the gospel. Would you allow me, after you and I have a talk, um, would you allow me to even talk to the congregation about running some classes about how to communicate with people? It was part of my message today. They didn't know that. Isn't God amazing? Isn't he totally in control? Because this is what we need to do. If it gets darker, our light should be shining brighter. We should be more visible, not hiding under the blankets. And I'm not sure... How many people are going to do this? But I tell you what, the very fact that we are gathering here under a Bible-believing ethos and a Bible-promoting ethos and a Jesus-witnessing church, we have a responsibility to do this. And I don't know where the Holy Spirit's going to take us, but I think it's going to be an exciting ride. I think it's going to be an exciting ride. And this is what we're going to, the message that we're going to promote to the people. Colossians 1, 15 to 17. He, Jesus Christ, 
is the image, the exact replica of the invisible God. He is the firstborn of all creation and he is not firstborn, he is the creator of all creation. That's a bad translation. And for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authority, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And I, I have to show you, <clears throat> you know I go on about translations. Well, I'm going to read a translation that I wouldn't normally use. But when I was thinking of the magnificence of God and, and the wonder of what he's done in my life and Sue's life and, and uh, um, what he's done with us is just absolutely amazing. And so I have, and I've always had on my shelf the Amplified Bible. Has anyone ever used the Amplified Bible or seen it? I had it way, way, way back, right at the start. And it was very helpful when you were coming on to terms and phrases that you didn't have a clue. They would sort of explain it. And uh, I just was looking um, uh, at Colossians 1, 15 to 17, and I got Hebrews 3. And this is it in the um, Amplified Body. Uh, sorry, the Amplified Bible. And so it's Hebrews 1, verse 3. The Son is the radiance and only expression, only expression of the glory of our awesome God, reflecting God's Shekinah glory, the light being and brilliant light of the divine, and the exact representation and perfect imprint of his Father's essence. Remember what he said to Thomas? Thomas said to him, but Lord, just show us the Father. And what did Jesus say? Thomas, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. He's the exact perfect imprint of his Father's essence and he is upholding and maintaining and propelling all things. The entire physical and spiritual universe by his powerful word, carrying the universe along to what? It's predetermined goal. We are going to get to Revelation 21 and 22 sooner than any one of us thinks. And Jesus is going to make sure that we all get there. And when he himself and no other had, by offering himself on the cross as a sacrifice for sin, accomplished purification from sins and established our freedom from guilt, he sat down revealing his completed work at the right hand of the majesty on high, revealing his divine authority. And if I can't have a hallelujah, I'm going home. I'm going to go back to, um, he has to be one of my favourite teachers, Chuck Missler. And... Um, I was listening to, I, I need um, liquid. Ever since I had the chemo, my voice box plays up sometimes. Um, but I was feeling sorry for myself about that until I read about Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon had manic depression and he would spend three months in bed and never go near the pulpit. And then he'd just one day wake up, get over it and go and preach again. So a croaky throat versus manic depression, I'll take the croaky throat any time. But when I was looking at this um, overwrought description of Jesus, I think it's absolutely wonderful. Chuck Missler was doing session two on uh, YouTube about the creation, Genesis chapter one. And he mentioned something that was absolutely and utterly amazing. And he said... Um, you know what he's like, he's so technical and so scientific, but I love that kind of thing. But he said, 
there's been an ongoing scientific debate for centuries about what is out there in space. Is it empty or is it full of something? And the latest science has determined that it's not only full of something, but it's full of energy. All right, it's full of energy. And Chuck said this, and you can go on to YouTube and look up his um, Genesis series on YouTube. It's done in about 2008, about seven years before he passed away. And it's very, very good. It's the kind of thing I really like. But he was saying that cosmologists and particle physicists and um, um, quantum mechanic specialists have worked out, listen to this, because it all relates to Jesus, not to science. Chuck was saying that if 100 million nuclear power stations produced power for 100 million years, you're listening, that total amount of energy exists in one cubic centimetre of outer space. And that was something that I just stored in my back, in the back of my mind. But you know what? Last year, I just was sitting in the room and the news was going on in the background and I heard that there's a company in America that is planning to put a space station up in space to mine the energy and beam it back down to Earth. Now listen... The very essence and existence of an atom is sometimes a mystery to scientists, why they don't just fly apart, what keeps them together. In fact, cosmologists and, and uh, uh, astronomers cannot work out what keeps all of the constellations in the universe in their exact place because gravity can't do it, the distances are too great. So no one understands how the universe stays as stable as it is. And about 10 years ago, it was another one of these news things that just fascinates my brain. A cosmologist actually put th forward a theory at a conference um, of, of these kinds of scientists at Cambridge, I think it was Cambridge University in Britain, and he was saying to this gathered, uh, you know, Illuminati, he was said, his model has shown that the universe is so completely unstable that there has to be an external source of power that feeds into it constantly to keep it stable. He lost his job. How unusual. He lost his job for stating that something outside the universe has to feed into the universe to keep it stable. And what does it say here? Upholding, maintaining and propelling all things, the entire physical and spiritual universe, by his powerful word. Jesus is keeping this universe stable and existent until he has finished our journey from there to heaven. And all of the redeemed will get there. And it will not be thwarted by anyone. And what we're going to go through, what this earth and this planet is going to go through over the next few years is beyond belief. And we'll look at that in the next um, few weeks. But you have to understand, A, God's in control. B, Jesus is maintaining everything in an orderly manner so that it happens. And when things do happen, even the four horsemen of the apocalypse in, Genesis, uh, sorry, in Revelation chapter 6, what happens? Not one of them can show themselves and do their job unless one of the four living creatures in heaven says, come, proceed. Jesus has to break the seal off the title deed to the earth and the four living creatures each in turn say, come, 
proceed. Even the horsemen of the apocalypse can't do anything until Jesus authorizes it. He is upholding and containing and ordering everything, even the great tribulation. Why? Because I said this in last week's message in Daniel chapter 12. The whole point of the tribulation is to break the power of the holy people. To break the stubbornness of the Jewish people. Why? Because it takes that for a believing remnant within them to recognize that he is God and he is their Messiah. And for 2,000 years, they have stubbornly resisted that revelation. And it's going to take that to break them. So when God tells you to examine your life and tells you to go into your bedroom to clean it up a bit, will you? Will you? Boy, am I going to get a flea in my ear on the way home. (laughs) She's got a list. (laughs) But he loves us. He doesn't do it to punish us. He doesn't do it to make our lives difficult. He does it because he wants us to be the best we can be when we get to be in his presence. So that the cleaning up process up there is that small, not that big. And you know what? It's up to us and it's up to you and I that we take a look at our family relationships at our friendships, our workplaces, our relationships with everyone around us. And we need to say, Lord, we can hear you telling us to put these things right before we meet. And I hope that song rings in your consciousness all week. I surrender all. And I know that um, Sue's going to be singing it at me (laughs) during the week. Um, I don't know. I still get angry at my two brothers and that that will not accept Jesus. I mean, I don't get angry with them. Um, And, uh, you know, uh, John uh, from the board and I met with uh, um, a lawyer because we're looking at, you know, bits and pieces, property and expanding, blah, blah, blah. And he is a, what he describes himself, he was the one I worked with for many years in the mining industry. He, he and I are like that. And, but he describes himself as a backslidden Catholic altar boy. Um, so he's not there yet. And uh, he sort of was joking um, he looked at John and he said, well, I was going to say something. He said, am I allowed to say the word hell? Um, uh, to describe sort of the state of something. And uh, John was far too polite to reply, but I have told him when he's asked me that in the past, well, if you don't accept Jesus now, Sonny, you're going to be an expert on that place, wh- whether you like it or not. And he... And, I've said that to him time and time and time again. I go, we go back 25 years. We did amazing things together. And John said when we left it, he said, I have never met such a friendly, nice lawyer in my life. And that's because we've got that 25-year relationship. And that's why I keep telling him, if you use that word, it's going to come back and bite you. And so that's why he sort of is drawn to us. And... and and he's getting excited about the potential of doing things and helping out Calvary Chapel Perth. And you see, this is the first step that we've taken in to shine the light of Jesus into that man's heart. His wife's a believer, but he's a stub... I don't know what happened to him as a kid. I do not know what happened to him as a kid, as a Catholic order boy. But there's this stubborn resistance there. But he always comes close to us and to me. And we're just going to keep witnessing until we're up and out of here.
But just remember this. I can taste our departure. Every day when I hear of what's happening out there in the world, Sue and I both look up and they say, Lord, we say, Lord, how much longer? They're holding down disabled children in the United States and vaccinating them. No consent, no parental approval. They're just vaccinating mentally disabled children in facilities. And we look at each other and we say, Lord, how much longer can you let this happen? Our departure from here, as JD says, you can taste it. But if that's true, then we better go into our bedroom and see what's lying around that needs to be put away. Father, we come before you this afternoon and I just bless you, Father. I just love you. I really do. I love Jesus. I love the Holy Spirit. I love these people here, Father. It's just amazing to be a Christian in this time. And before we finish, and we've got time, I have asked Ben to come back. And I might do this more frequently, but I want him to come back and I want us to sing that song again. Ben? Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Saviour, who alone is wise, be glory, majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen.